Thank you all for having me. My name is Ajuna Keruzi. I'm here to talk to you about what Roman stories taught me about instant management. And you might have already seen that I actually mean this to be what rom-coms did not teach me about instant management. So a little bit about me. Um, I currently work as a developer advocate at Datadog. My previous background is as an SRE, so I did a lot of instance, and I still think a lot about instance in my current role. And to answer the most important question, my favorite rom-com is Pretty Woman. But to set the stage, let me talk about instant management. So when I describe instant management, I talk about the process of responding to outages and instance in your service with minimal further disruption to said service. So I think about everything from your system that pages you when you're on call to actually responding to the outage and all the post-incident things to make sure that you've learned from the incident and everything's back okay. So if we think about, imagine you're on call, it's a lovely Friday night, you know, things have been quiet, you're kind of just hanging out, chilling, and then all of a sudden your pager goes off. And I will play the sound right now, but in this room, I don't want all of you to just like panic. So I won't. But imagine just like something just like snaps you out of sleep, right? Because something went wrong and you respond to your incident. Generally, the timeline looks like this, right? The impact happens, the right system is called, it pages you, you are the right person, you respond, you, you realize it's actually an incident, so you declare it. You reach out to other people on your team if you need more help, you figure out what's going on, you resolve it. I'm really kind of fudging the middle. I'm really <laughs> thinking about the overall process, right? Um, you mark it as stable, make sure that things aren't continuously kind of breaking, and then you resolve it. And then there's the follow-up process, and I love talking about that, and sadly we don't do that enough in this talk, but um, there's the follow-up of like post-mortems or post-instant reviews, and then the instant's over. But that's very different to how rom-coms go. I there's a very like timeline that happens with incidents that doesn't happen with rom-coms at all. And I'm focusing on movies because books are similar with different problems, <laughs> but let's just focus on movies because I think we might have a very common understanding or watch similar movies. But the reason I wanna talk about rom-coms is also just cause I like them, sorry. <laughs> I made everyone come here and talk about something that I like. But also I like them now. For a very long period of time, I didn't write, like rom-coms. I found them really boring. And if there wasn't an explosion, my mind wasn't like in, into what was going on. But I guess I got a little bit older and I got a lot more tired. <laughs> And I really enjoyed the formulaic aspect of, of watching rom-coms, like you really know what's going on. And I love the idea that you can like fall asleep and wake up and know exactly what happened. And when I rewatched rom-coms, that's my favorite bit. I also have a lot of decision fatigue. Even deciding what I wanna eat day to day is something I forget I have to do and then I'm like, oh crap, and then I order food. I did get a Philly cheesesteak yesterday because I'm not from Philly and I was very excited to have an immediate answer of what I'm supposed to eat when I was here. Um, but rom-coms don't have to be dramatic. If we think about Titanic, this is one of the more dramatic ones. We can all argue that they both could have fit on that board no matter what happened. But I like the community that goes with rom-coms. There's a lot of ones here that are my favorites. Maybe we have mutual favorites. The 90s ones, a lot of people say are the best. Pretty Woman's up there, Coming to America. I did hear Love Actually, Sleepless in Seattle, when I talked to other people at like the speaker dinner on Monday. Um, but there's some new ones. Love Guaranteed's pretty good. I haven't watched Anyone But You, which I think just came out with Anne Hathaway. But I generally love almost all of them right now. But if we think about that formula, it's kind of a known secret. Part of it is storytelling, but it's very much like they meet, it's called the meet cute. And then they have some sort of disagreement, but they start dating. And then a revelation happens that we've all known from the beginning that something is wrong. And then they have a very dramatic dip and then they get back together and there's always a happy ending. And that's very important to me. <laughs> I want it to get resolved before I go to sleep. Maybe it's because also as an incident, I'm also just like, oh, what happened next? And I'm really curious. So I love that we always get that like pick back up right at the end. 
And like I said, it's kind of like writing. There's like a beginning, middle, and end. Um, and usually that crisis into like climax of like the top is my favorite bit. Also, I now love guessing what I think the problem is going to be right at the beginning. As they start hinting at it, I'm like, oh, maybe that's the thing. And I love being wrong, but I'm often not because I've watched a lot of them now. There's lots of tropes. Love a trope. <laughs> Running through airport. Great trope. And you might be like, oh, they did that in the 90s. TSA does not let you do that anymore. Things have changed. 2018, Crazy Rich Asians. He proposed on a plane. Sorry, that's a spoiler. But a great movie to watch on planes, too, if you're flying out of here. Amazing. I mean, it is Crazy Rich Asians, so he did buy a ticket to propose to her on the plane. But it still happens. Love that they continued the trope. There's also great lines. If you've watched Pretty Woman, this is a very common one where they regret not selling her stuff, and she's like, big mistake, big, huge. And that pause is very important as you say it. And I love that community aspect of it, too. But I'll go all the way back to instant management again, as I've hopefully convinced you to at least watch a rom-com in the next month or so. But often we think about instant management as like, this is a tech thing. It's not a people thing. It's really hard to like conflate the two. And I really want to tell people about the history of instant management, and a lot of it is from firefighting. There's a sad history to this because of fires and that they've led to, sadly, human life passing. But the big reason that instant management started, or the way that we do it, is from a big fire in Laguna in 1970. It happened for about 12 days in late September, 16 people died and there was millions of damage. The issue was it was such a big fire at the time that there were over 200 different fire departments that were called in to work on the fire, but they didn't have the same systems. They didn't have the same radio frequencies. So they couldn't coordinate about what was going on. So after the fire ended, the fire chiefs came together and had a conversation and came up with an group called FireScope, which is the Firefighting Resources of Southern California Organized for Potential Emergencies. I appreciate the acronym. Um, but they came in and decided that we have to have a certain list of ways to respond to these outages that we can work together. A lot of the issues that they found was there was a lot of duplication of efforts. The real people who were very specialized didn't know where to go, so they were being misused. The um, coordinating what was happening between them was very difficult. Knowing who to listen to was also very difficult. Between the different groups, who is the actual leader for each group so you know who to reach out to and so forth. How do you continue when people eventually do need to sleep and you have to swap new people in? So they came up with the instant command system, which might be very familiar to all of us who've been on call, but the main problem um, the main components of the instant command system were there's only one leader, that's the instant commander, and everyone only reports to one person, which means that information flows through a singular human to another human back to the instant commander. But also that there's different departments that are trained for different things, right? The instant commander group, there might be a few of them that swap out. They've all been trained in how to be an instant commander and the coordination effort that goes with that. There are the other responders who are trained on their systems and know how to work with that. There are people who know things like admin, communications, operations, planning. In a computer incident, we even have folks who are maybe executive leadership communication, right? To know who to talk to about the right things and that inflammation can go in the right way. So this instant command structure was started with firefighting and then spread to the national instant management system, which is used for any major incident around the world, and it's been adopted by different places, including us in tech. And there are a lot of similarities in incidents, right? Um, these firefighters had to come up with different ways of responding, um, not only for during the instance, but prevention and preparation outside of it, which are the fire codes, which we also have in tech. There's another great talk about relating firefighting and incident by Tanya Riley, it's on SRECon, about the history of fire escapes, which talk about the preparation of how to um, prepare yourself for incidents and getting away from fires because of fire escapes, and I think it's a, another really cool one. 
But what do they have in common with tech instance? There's an instant commander. We're also usually surprised. <laughs> Even though you might have a planned outage, it getting bigger is always a surprise, right? So that always matters. It's also time be becomes a really important factor. It's more important when lives are on the line, but even with our instance and in technology, sometimes lives are. Um, if you manage um, phone companies, making sure that responders get to the right place matters. If you work on um, pacemakers or other like um, technology for cars or planes, all of it kind of points to time being a factor to make sure that people are getting access to their system. We also never know how the, system, the situation is going to go from the start. There's a lot of work that we have to do to understand what's happening quickly and respond as we get new information. And the resources that we have change over time. Not only the human resources of the people who are working on it, because people do need to sleep to stay alert, but even the Technological resources need to change. We need to bring newcomers up to speed and so forth. So going back to this instant timeline that I showed earlier, um, I decided to think, even though it is a timeline and it's a bit more straighter, the instant, um, the rom-com timeline looks kind of similar, right? There's a beginning part, there's a tension part, they have the crisis, and then they resolve it. They do some things really badly, though, and that's the part that was interesting to me. And I'll do a case study with one of my other favorite rom-coms, 27 Dresses. Has anyone watched <laughs> 27 Dresses? Okay, a couple people, cool. So for folks who haven't watched it, this is a movie from the, um, the early 2000s with, um, what's her name again? Oh, no. Katherine Heigl, thank you, um, where she has been a bridesmaid 27 times. That's where the name of the movie comes from. And so someone finds out that she has been who is a reporter and reaches out to her but doesn't tell her that he's a reporter. And they inevitably talk and fall in love. And from the beginning, you're like, dude, tell her. Like, what's going on? That's kind of secretive. And then that becomes the issue. He doesn't tell her that he's a reporter. So... Then she finds out it's a big deal, they resolve it. But when watching the movie, I was just like, no one took responsibility the entire time. Generally, it should be the person who's lying, but overwhelmingly, there should be something that's going on. They're very disjointed. There's a lot of miscommunication. But you can also see that it's building up, right? If he told her at the beginning, she'd be like a little mad. But when she finds out because the article he wrote about her got published, she's quite annoyed, which is also valid because now it's a a national thing. So you can see it building up and you're just like, ooh, the entire time, which is, I enjoy. Um, there's also a lot of miscommunication. You can see them just talking to everyone but each other about the big things that are going on. Um, I appreciate the times at the end when they're talking to the best friend and ice cream and other ways to like relax or being involved. But either way, it's just like, just these two people needed to talk to each other and things would have been much easier. But also at the end, they jump to, okay, she forgives him. And then they like, a year later, they're married. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> how, what, did, what happened here? What did they review? Did they reflect? I know it might be boring to show an entire therapy session on the movie, but I really want to know that things got better and that they didn't inevitably have the same problem again, which I think is that instant like um, manager or instant responder in me to be like, did you learn from that? Um, so if I compare them to incidents, right, this moment at the end where we see all of her bridesmaids wearing the very terrible dresses that they've made her wear over the years, really had me be like, I really feel like we've jumped to happily ever after way too soon. So if I was to rewrite them, they would be more boring. But if I put my instant commander hat on, the ways that I would make them get it right is, of course, just having an instant commander or someone to take responsibility at all, right? One person to be there to be like, hey, this is the plan for how we can resolve this thing. Or just like, I'm going to take responsibility and set us onto the right course would be fantastic. Also, the way that it builds up reminded me of instant severities, right? Where like a lower severity is when he didn't tell her right at the beginning. And then at the end, we are at a sev one where it's like the whole world knows that 
he's a reporter reporting about her except her, right? And then it became a sev one or a sev zero if you're in that environment. But I'm like, you really could have caught this much earlier on before it became an all hands on deck situation. Instant communication. I'm not saying to use Slack for your personal relationships. That would be a little weird. I did see a tweet about someone who said they had a notion book with their household, with like talking to their partner about how to plan their house. It was controversial. So using tech tools to solve your like interpersonal problems can be a little bit weird. But if I step back and think about it from like a tech perspective, having a unified place to have all of the discussions is helpful. It doesn't have to be Slack. Obviously, text messages can be helpful in real life, but in an actual instant, we don't want to have individuals talking to each other as much as possible, right? Putting it all in one place so we have the same discussion. It would be weird to have his friends and her friends in this scenario in one giant like group text message, but then everyone would know what was going on, which would be a different problem in the movie, but anyway. Postmortems or a review, um, I would love to know that they were like, hey, how could you have communicated with me better? And very much being like, if you told me you were a reporter earlier. But just having a place where just it's automated to have all the information that you need would have made things much easier. Maybe just for me to know that their relationship was going to last past a year. But generally automating this process and just having it that all the information that you need, what happened, why did it happen, timeline in one place would have been fantastic. So back to rom-coms. Um, there are a lot of really cool ones, and I appreciate learning something new about my real life every time I watch them. And there's a lot of really cool things to learn. I hope you go and watch one. But because I said that I didn't want to talk about books, um, very briefly, you can sometimes judge a book by the cover. And the reason I didn't bring up books is that there's some really weird romance books out there. These are real books. I did not make them up. You can buy them on your favorite bookstore. Kissing the Coronavirus is the worst one that is up here. It is about, a, it says she was supposed to cure the coronavirus, instead she fell in love with it. That is all you need to know. It has two sequels. So ask yourself how that happened. So books can be a little bit weird. But thank you so much for your time. I think I have a few minutes for questions. Is that okay? I also am very open to talking about it one-on-one, -on -one, about anything. I will also have a conversation about what counts as a rom-com. Rom um, controversial opinion, Deadpool is a rom-com. It counts. Question is back here. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I work on a pretty small team, yeah. and so while we probably have some procedures for incidents, I don't think we have the most formalized uh, process. So what, are, what advice do you have for starting from somewhat scratch or just, you know, what's the best way of starting to formalize the incident process for a small team or if a big team doesn't have one either, I guess that's good too. I do think that the instant management process is helpful for whatever team size you have and might actually matter more for a smaller team, though the coordination part might matter less. So coming up with a centralized place of who is currently irresponsible that are, is the person we should wake up is the first part. The next part is if there are common ways that we resolve these types of problems, let's write them down so that when we have new people join our team, they at least can get something started. And if it gets worse, they know who to contact. And then the next part of discussing incidents as they, after they happen to learn from them would be the next portion. And then you can kind of build up from there. It starts to matter a lot when you want to start training people. So before you are training, um, it just feels like a whole lot of effort to kind of build the wheel again. And it does take some effort if there isn't a joint culture to work on it. So having the discussion of, hey, maybe even starting 
after an incident, I think that people are most invested in res finding out and how to improve their incident systems after an incident happened. So that's a great time to get people on board because they are just have felt the pain of what an incident is. So getting them on board to be like, hey, this could be a little bit better if we started improving our processes this way and kind of building from there. Um, the Google SRE books can be really helpful for this because they build out what is an ideal. So you can start from there and make it work for you. It's not perfect. It worked for Google. Um, I worked there at, around the time the books came out, so I know that some bits are helpful, some bits don't work even internally sometimes. So you have to really make it work for you. They are a larger company, so as a bigger team, some other bits might matter more like Follow the sun rotations where you have people on call for shorter periods of time so you don't like burn them out. That might not be possible if you have a three-person team. Um, it should still try to make sure you don't burn them out, but some of those bits don't become as practical, so you have to make it work for you. But I hope that helps. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was uh, really curious about the inspiration you had gotten um, making the connections between rom-com and incident management. Yeah. That makes sense that um, your personal life could connect to your professional life. But I'm really curious, how did you get in the realm of like making the connection between the, the fire, um, the firefighting incident management and that? Because I, I personally wouldn't, you must have had like some connections or like family members. I'm just really curious how you got that inspiration as well. Oh, I think I watched a talk about the history of instant command system, which that firefighters used, and then I got really interested by that. I also was trying to write a talk at the time, and I was watching a lot of rom-coms, and I made the connection. I just personally like trying to see how much I can introduce pop culture into the things that I know. I do have a different talk that discusses like Marvel movies and how the destruction of those is also terrible for incidents. Um, so that's just maybe the way that I think. Um, but I like building those connections and it makes it connect better for me and hopefully for people who haven't been, who are being introduced to it for the first time, it'll hit better for them. And people who've learned it can see it from a slightly different way. So win, win, win a little bit. Question? Cool. Hi, thank you. Um, we have an incident management functions and we're a large company. So I'm curious to uh, think if you have any thoughts to share around um, what does that look like for a centralized incident management team and what is like some of the shared responsibilities and functions um, that really make it work? So in this case, is it like an SRE team that responds to all incidents? We actually are separate. We do have an incident management team, and then we have an SRE team um, in, in an entire, like, we're an IT, but we're not an entirely IT company. Cool. Um, so the way that I've heard about it is, um, in different places is having an instant management team often focuses on the process of instant management and building the systems that make it better. So that is the on-call error system, the post-mortem system, the way to like page people, things like that. And then to also do the responders and I mean the review at the end to make sure that that process happens. And then the SRE teams have seen like different levels of instant response. So having teams that focus on incidents that are like SEV1 or SEV2, which are like larger scale incidents to like tag a new team of people who've worked on those and know how to do the things like external communication and um, executive communication and stuff. So that's one way that having a larger coordination effort starts to matter because you also have more people that you have to manage as responders and also more people that are stakeholders that you have to communicate with. Um, other than that, it's really case by case, and I would love to talk about it more one-on-one -on -one if that helps. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. There's a question here. Yes. Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm curious about the incident commander specifically or if there is a role for documenting the process of managing the incident, right? So the AAR being like a critical document to produce, do you find that it's more important to have 
really accurate timelines and RCAs in the AAR. So like the incident commander would be doing the documentation. Is someone separate responsible for that? Or do you just use like Slack and aggregate like, okay, here's the conversation and this is what we think happened? Oh, um, a lot of the times people want accurate numbers in order to calculate things like time to response or time for resolution and things like that. So if you are care about those types of metrics, automating that as much as possible can be really helpful. So in your incident tool, if it helps you by finding out exact, like declaring it, obviously it'll know that time and when it ends, but even having an option to like edit when it actually started so you can show where the impact started. I like using um, tools that automate as much of that away from me. I showed Datadog because I work there. We use our own tool that does some of that. I do think no matter what you use, you can make it work for you. I have seen people who put all of that into their communication system. So if you use IRC or Slack or whichever, just making sure that there is a central source of truth, a single place of with all the information. So during the incident, you can have a person that's a note taker or a documenter who writes down everything that happens, or you can just word vomit as much as possible into that one place so that all of it is there. And then when you're a little bit calmer, you can go back and look at what those times are and you can say, oh, this is the corrected time. If there's a way to like highlight which messages are more important with those um, information with like an emoji or able to save it in a different place, it's helpful. Um, connecting a document like Google Docs or whatever to your instant channel where people can write that in there instead of putting it on the channel is also great. But I prefer it when everyone knows this is the document that we're using. This is like the Zoom call that we're all in. This is a Slack channel we're all in so that everyone knows where to go. When they have duplicates is where things can get complicated as it is after an instant. Looking back at that document is already tiring for a lot of people. And a lot of us prefer to like take a nap, which is you should, but also go back to it before all the context is lost to you. 